Out on Burles in Redder Road, police were scanning the carnage of a crash that killed four people instantly, trying to find the person responsible for it. But as it turns out, they wouldn't be the first to do that. What condition was he in? He was unconscious. Corbin Clark and his mother, Shauna, two neighbors heading to the scene, find a passed out teenager in a ditch a quarter mile down the road. And I kept saying, hey, what's your name? What's your name? He'd say, what's your name? And he said, hey, man, I'm, I'm Ethan. I can get you out of all this. I was like, I guess he thought I was involved. But he was like, yeah, just remember my name. I'll get you out of all this. He kept saying that. His name, Ethan Couch, is now one everybody remembers. Somehow, he not only survived the crash, but managed to free himself from the mangled truck. And rather than help anyone, he walked away. The police came, and they, they said, we need to get you in that, into an ambulance. Was he struggling with the officers? He kept trying to shake them off, saying, I don't need all this. Once Ethan Couch was found, the story came together pretty quickly. That shocking story would turn sadness into outrage. Get this, Ethan's a 16-year-old living the life of an adult by himself just seven doors down from Eric Boyles. Where were his parents? Well, Fred and Tanya Couch had already moved on up to this sprawling place in Fort Worth, a 7,000 square foot compound. Take a look at that glittering metal roof. You're looking at the Couch moneymaker. Fred's got a multi-million dollar sheet metal business. But the story of the crash begins to be told by Ethan's blood alcohol content. It comes back three times the legal limit for an adult. And that's three hours after the crash. Now understand, this is three hours of time he had for his body to clear alcohol out of his system. Speculation, what his blood alcohol was at the time of the accident is through the roof. As Ethan awakes in a hospital bed, the sun also rises over Burleson Redder Road. It is Father's Day. The next day, yeah, I find these packages where my Father's Day cards have been filled out. And my Father's Day gifts were there. I bet they were gone. There was no, no preparation, no time to say goodbyes or anything else. Out in front of Eric's house, investigators are still sifting through the crash site. Wreckage that spans almost a city block. And seven doors down, officers pay a visit to Ethan's Burleson house. No one's home but a trash bin brimming with cans and bottles right outside paints a vivid picture of the last night's activities. So not only was he drunk, but there were traces of THC, Valium, and some other drugs. Right, which according to our toxicologists um, were bad enough on their own, but you combine those with alcohol, just a recipe for disaster. Richard Alpert is an assistant district attorney who came onto the case just a day after the crash. The first thing we started doing was bringing those witnesses in and talking to them. Will you please state your name? Garrett Ballard. Star Teague. Garrett Ballard, Ethan's best friend since grade school, and Star Teague, a former and brief love interest, were two of the teens in Ethan's red truck that night. I just remember seeing something. These are deposition tapes from a civil lawsuit resulting from the crash. Star says Ethan, Garrett, and another boy started drinking around 6 p.m. the night of the crash. They, all three of them did a shot of vanilla. I don't, I don't know what it was. So they start drinking, taking some shots, and then they decide to go pick up some friends. On the way back, they decide well, we want to get some beer. So there's already alcohol at the house, and Ethan clearly has money, but they decide it'd be more fun to steal the beer. At the Walmart, I went in, grabbed the beer. This is surveillance video from that Walmart. Sure enough, there's Garrett Ballard and four other teenage boys. Then we walked out to the fire exit. Ethan stayed with the vehicle, and when the other five stole the case of beer, they actually ran out the exit door. The teens head back to Ethan's empty house, and the drinking continues. Not just beer, but shots of the 190 proof grain alcohol called Everclear. And then the young woman um, needs to go to the convenience store. But even the other ones who've been drinking knew Ethan had too much to drink, and they tried to talk him out of it. And he would have none of it. it just made him angry. With that, all eight teenagers pile into the truck. With Ethan Couch behind the wheel, Star, the young woman's telling him to slow down. 
so his response is, well, I'll just drive into oncoming traffic. So he starts playing chicken with a car in front of him. I was yelling at him, get over, get over, you need to get over. And when he swerved, the back tires jerked. I just remember seeing something in the road, and then loud bang, and I remember being in the air. The vehicle was going about 68 miles per hour. Had Ethan ever pumped the brakes? No brakes. Never touched the brakes? No evidence of braking was there. You know, your brain, when you're that intoxicated, doesn't work the way it should. When we come back, Ethan Couch may have walked away from the crash, but walking away from the consequences of it wouldn't be as easy. Not with this prosecutor determined to get justice. I don't know if Ethan's life is salvageable. And quite frankly, I don't care. But this guy's about to give him the shock of his career. I think Ethan Couch is suffering from uh, 